Um, thank you, Ian, for that talk, which was uh, certainly boring in places, <laughs> perhaps. Um, we've got about 10 minutes for questions. <coughs> Who would like to start? Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Ian. I really enjoyed the paper. I thought you were going to be level, but you were tending to say the obvious, and I thought that you started off with a rather interesting approach I wonder if you can come back to politics and say, is there a position for political art? Is there a position for political art? Yeah, I really don't know. Um, I'm, you know, there's that fabulous book which says, you know, one click to save the world as a kind of uh, criticism of the idea that we can use the internet or use internet technology to make real changes. Whether political art exists now, I don't know. I mean, most political art memes circulate on Facebook where we click that we like it and it does exactly nothing to change the world. Uh, maybe that's not the job of political art, I don't know. But certainly my view is politics is not happening on Facebook. Um, politics is not happening in art because it's being massively captured by um, the kind of capitalist machines. And sure, there may be guerrilla art out there that's you know, having an effect, and, and that's great too. Uh, so it seems to me that we would have to think more about our definitions of art and, and more what we mean by political in an art context. But the short answer is no, I don't think there is much of a place for political art right now. Um, I think that probably the state of politics right now is that it, we need to kind of get right back to grassroots and think, well, how do we... You know, as Deleuze says, you know, politics is for people yet to come. Um, and I think the flip side of that would be we can't just sit around thinking that people's going to arrive without us doing any effort. I mean, I, I would say that my one serious critique of Hart and Negri in that respect would be they kind of say the multitude already exists. Well, I think that's bullshit. I think the multitude has to be manufactured, it has to be created, uh, and we have to get out there and get amongst the people and make it happen. It won't happen through art. But of course, you're talking about boredom as a kind of micro-political well, I guess I'm, I'm talking about boredom as our, as our own subjective response, as a space and as a kind of um, subjectivity that might enable us to achieve a kind of politics. But certainly I think you know, the distracted state is not where politics begin. Um, I think it might be helpful if we complexify our understanding of political art, because there's certainly art about political content, but then there are also all these other forms of art which are political precisely because of how people interact with the whole process. And the only reason I'm thinking is you're talking about this like tidal wave of technology that's keeping us disconnect, sorry, um, disconnected from each other and the world. And I'm almost thinking that art that doesn't directly challenge that, if we think it's a bad thing, is political precisely because it's surrendering, surrendering to that dominant form. Um, so anyway, just to throw that out there at you. Well, certainly I would agree with the idea that we need to complexify our thinking about art. But I guess I would say that um, any great form of art will be, an, will be art that somehow manages to jolt us out of, uh, not just the distraction of digital technology, but out of, out of an idea of, of how we think about our society that will make us see it anew. So anything that sort of fails to do that will just simply become commodified and become part of that. And that's, you know, very difficult. And it's also a really huge expectation of artists. I mean, they've got to make a living, so I don't have any problem with artists, you know, kind of cashing in on their talent and making a living and putting their kids through school. That's fine too. Uh, and it may not be just the great artists that do it. Who knows how it'll come and, and what form it'll take. And that's the, you know, that's the obvious thing about innovation is true innovation is always a disruption. It's a distraction. We don't know where it's going to come from or in what form. And I think that's the essential thing that Deleuze and Guattari says, that we can only talk about art or history in a determinate way from the perspective of the future looking back. We can't look forward and say this is what it will look like. This is how it's going to be. Well, I'm just saying because there's already several decades of like relational aesthetics now uh, that have been discussed in a very critical context, which really have nothing to do with like the physical creation of an object. Right. Yeah, no, I agree. You're talking about an experience. You're talking about boredom as an experience, right? So I think, yeah, it absolutely ties with that. But has great art always been boring, and that, or is this something, you know, is it very sort of? Well, what I'm suggesting is that boredom, as a possible experience, has become extremely difficult to encounter because we have so many ways of not being bored. Um, 
you know, even if you hated my talk, you were just there on your cell phone, you're doing Facebook, whatever, you know, that wasn't possible 20 years ago. It wasn't possible 50 years ago, 100 years ago, you would just been stuck. You just had to go to sleep or something. But now you can, you know, get on your cell phone, get on the internet, you can book your travel home, you think, fuck this shit, I'm out of here, I'm going to book myself a new flight, whatever, you know. So our engagement with, with, with our surroundings, with our encounters, has been rapidly transformed in, in so many ways. So boredom as an experience is something that has disappeared, is what I'm suggesting. And I'm just kind of, you know, perhaps provocatively, asking the question, what does it mean if we can't be bored anymore? What does it mean if we can't tolerate our own heads, our own inner self as company so much that the minute we start to feel bored, we think, fuck it, got to get out my cell phone, go onto Facebook or whatever. It's very, very interesting. I mean, it means that the contemplative attitude that we always used to think of as being part of the experience of art is under real danger now. Like, just do this as an experiment. Go to an art gallery and see how many people actually look at a painting and don't do this. I'm seeing like, people walk around the Louvre doing that and you think... What did they actually see? What did they actually experience? Do they get home and watch the video of it and think, I had an awesome time in that gallery. It was amazing. Um, the very nature of experience has changed and, and how that's going to affect what artistic encounters are going to look like, I think, is something we really need to discuss seriously. Yeah, in the corner there. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I guess there's a couple of ways I would think about this. First of all, I think that, you know, what Deleuze and Guattari say about binaries is that you have to keep constructing binaries and keep using them until they kind of explode on you. So it's, it's more or less unavoidable to start using them as a way into the talk. Um, but secondly, what I was kind of getting at is really how we perceive ourselves in relation to technology. So it's the idea that we think of ourselves as being autonomous in relation to our devices. And the fact that we think of them as being our devices is kind of the issue that I was trying to get at. Now, it, it is obviously true that our... And, you know, McLuhan was saying this 60 years ago, that our consciousness is extended and in different ways externalised and so forth through our interaction with technology, such that, yes, you know, people are already saying this now that we have Google... We don't need to remember anything anymore because Google can do it for us. So absolutely, it's transforming both what we think of as consciousness and what we think of as technology and blurring the boundaries between those two things. But if we end up with a position of saying, well, everything's the mind, everything's technology, blah, 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 then how do we have any kind of a conversation about it? And, and I think the other thing that Deleuze and Guattari said, which I, is really important, is that all concepts have to have cutting edges. There have to be a point where you say this is this and that is that, and somehow we're talking about an interaction between those two things. Now, it may be that over time we want to change our definitions of this and that and think more carefully about the interaction, but it doesn't mean we stop thinking in terms of this and that. I think there was one last question, or two last questions from the corner
banking this like this kind of evil kind of practice? Is there not a potentiality contained within this novel also? Uh, well, I mean, don't get me wrong, I do it too, so it's not like I'm saying it's evil, uh, and I certainly didn't say it's evil. What I said was it's an, a new mode of interacting with art that was not technologically possible 20 years ago. People didn't have smartphones 20 years ago. They didn't have readily available video technology uh, cameras. They had cameras, they had video cameras and so forth, but it wasn't everybody. It wasn't children, old people, just everyone that has cell phones. So. It's a, it's a new kind of experience. There were um, precursors to it, absolutely. Um, and so I think, yes, of course, there has always been technology, but technology you know, peaks and brings about new kinds of experiences that were technologically not possible previously. Uh, and so any reasonable kind of history wants to look at a moment when a new kind of subjectivity became possible. It wasn't possible before. Maybe we anticipated it. I don't know. Um, and I think that's, you know, within a Deleuze and Guattari context, they always say that it's not technology that shapes subjectivity, but rather somehow su subjectivity latches onto the technology, wants that technology, um, that if we didn't want cell phones, they wouldn't have sold. Now, I think that's, you know, that's a debatable point. But the other thing I said was that even if we go back to the 1920s and we think about the fact that they didn't have cell phones but they still had uh, newspapers and magazines and so forth, what I was trying to say then is that what we forget now in the realm of cell phones is how radically new that must have seemed to them. It doesn't seem radical and new to us now, but it must have then. And that was also my point about Edison. You go back 120 years ago, you didn't have music in your house unless you played an instrument. You didn't have music in shopping malls. You didn't have music on your iPhone, etc., etc. These are new kinds of experiences that technology made possible, new kinds of experiences that have entered the realm of everyday life and have become subject to a kind of a cultural evolution uh, and have you know, mutated and innovated and, and, and moved on in all kinds of directions, which are, you know, for the most part, wonderful. I'm not critical of these things and saying, oh, these are all shit, I, by no means. What I'm saying is they've unleashed new forms of subjectivity that we should be studying, that we should be mapping and not simply celebrating and go, that's awesome, but saying, well, what are the costs of this? What are the opportunities? What are the, you know, the kind of uh, problems that these things raise? I would like to come back to the question of the political yeah, and boring, being boring as a political concept. So there are a lot of performances who are now working with the concept of not perform. So exactly to create that break of you have to produce, you have to work, you, you have to be active. There yeah? are all these myths of modernity which created that way of hyper-productivity. And also, if I look back as a philosopher in the very beginning of philosophy, if you look to Aristotle, for example, you have the notion of leisure. So couldn't that be, right now, a very political statement to come back and introduce in a certain way the concept of leisure exactly as a concept that is really radical against what is going on, especially as you described it with having no break anymore in our daily lives. So isn't that also a very political concept? And if we take it as a very political concept as philosophers, then we would have to deconstruct in a certain way notions like being only an activist or being active all the time and productivity. So there would be work also as a philosopher to really start to work from the humanity. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to a kind of an old debate within Marxism, which is the distinction between the right to work and the right to be lazy. Um, and, you know, you're absolutely right. Leisure is a radical concept, but it's also a concept that is constantly being captured by capitalism and marketed and packaged up to us. You know, go on a trip here, take time out from your busy life and do this, that or the other. So it's, it's exceedingly difficult to see that as being political in and of itself. And, you know, I'm sure that's kind of what Deleuze and Guattari had in mind when they talked about apparatuses of capture, that even the things that we think are political are available for capture by non-political forms or by, you know, the most radical political form of all, which is neoliberalism. Um, the other thing I would say is that, you know, in terms of political art, political concepts, I mean, one of the things that has always struck me as being extremely important in what Deleuze and Guattari say is that Politics is not something you can do individually. Politics has to be 
collective. So the moment you decide to do X, Y, or Z in response to a political situation, it's meaningless if you are the only person doing it. Okay? It has to be something that is, that is collective. It has to be something that becomes a currency through an entire population, through an entire people. And that's what makes it so hard. Individual political gestures are easily defeated. They're all just you know, trees falling in a forest that nobody's listening to. But collective gestures, concepts that somehow break into the collective unconscious, the collective conscious, whatever term you want to use, those are the things that are political. But we never know where they're going to come from. Uh, and that's why they're so difficult for us to construct, so difficult for us to think about. But I think we should at least be able to say some things are not political, they don't do anything, they're merely entertainment, but there are other things that are political. Let's kind of sort out the things that are doing important work for us and the other things that are just ornamentation. I think the last question from Eric. Yeah. This is where we have to start to think and not, not to stop. If you would agree. So, I mean, how, how do you conceive this question, which means not, okay, political art is not given nowadays, let's say, in a convincing way, which was, let's say, your immediate flank of Daniel's answer. Now, the other question is, yeah, how would you define uh, the condition of reality to construct or our time, our airport time, the revolution of political art? Yeah, well, look, I think you should have given my talk. You did it in, in five minutes. <laughs> uh, no, look, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, the, the most radical conclusion that one could draw from what I'm saying is that there is no political art right now we don't know what it would look like because we can't imagine it just yet. Um, and so then it does raise the question of whether or not is art something that we should expect? I mean, must art necessarily exist? Must art be the thing that will come along? Maybe it won't. I mean, that would be an even more radical conclusion. We might not want to say to ourselves, oh, that's it, that's the end of art, and that seems a bit too kind of doomsday to even say such a thing. But why not? Why not say that, well, the thing that we used to think of as art, as a kind of cultural form of mediation that, you know, challenged how we think, challenged how we operate, that that thing is over. Just as we are quite happy to say religion, for most people within a Western Christian period, is over. It doesn't have the same influence on our daily life that it used to have. Maybe art has reached the same kind of limit, that we are, in a sense, secular when it comes to art. 
Now, I don't know. It's a radical thesis, and it's not even something that I'm you know, prepared to defend. But I do want to defend the possibility that we may be in a realm where that could happen, that has happened, and we, perhaps we can't simply think, well, art has always existed, therefore it will continue to exist. And you know, we don't know what that good art is right now, but it, it will come because we have faith in art. Maybe that's misplaced. Uh, well, not quite, because he, he was also... I mean, I agree with you with respect to the simulacrum, and I think that that is something that has been um, not talked about enough. We kind of think that, you know, the sort of Baudrillard moment is over. I completely agree. I think that that has to be extended. I don't know if Baudrillard was quite prepared to say that we have entered a kind of post-art era in the same way that we have entered a post-religious era. That may be, may be kind of where he was heading. But I think the other thing about that Baudrillard, he could never quite give up on the idea that there was something behind the simulacra that we kept failing to see, but somehow we could maybe take the scales from our eyes and we would see it. Um, so the more radical position would be, well, there is nothing behind that. And maybe that's also where he was going, in which case then, you know, the next obvious thing for us to do is to have a, a Deleuze and Baudrillard conference. that note, with a tinge of pessimism. We're going to continue this. Uh, yeah, can you please thank Ian? Sorry. <laughs>